Hello, my name is Karina Forsen. I work for the Washington Geological Survey. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the geology of Washington. First off, how do we use geology in our everyday lives? Um, geologists help save lives by studying natural hazards such as earthquakes, volcanoes, and tsunamis, and landslides. Geologists also study mining. Uh, this includes gravel for roads, extracting metals for things like your iPhone and batteries for your computers, stuff that we need to live comfortably in the world we've grown accustomed to. Jewelry, you get your bling thanks to a geologist. Geologists were able to find those minerals and put them into fun things like crowns and rings and cool necklaces. Energy, we all rely on electricity. It's pretty neat. There's different sources of energy, geothermal, oil and gas, coal. We're able to gas up our cars thanks to a geologist and have cool neon signs such as this burritos as big as your head because a geologist was able to find the energy reserve to power those lights. Food, we all eat it and it has to grow in dirt and dirt comes from, you guessed it, rocks. Except for flaming hot Cheetos. I'm not really sure where those come from. And last but not least, geology lets us study cool science. People get to study volcanoes on other planets and go into lava lakes, thanks to geology. Today I'm gonna to be talking to you a little bit about the geology of Washington. This is a geologic map of Washington State. All the different colors represent different rock types. The geology of Washington is pretty complicated. And learning about how it formed and when the rocks were deposited or emplaced is like a puzzle that geologists have to figure out. First, we need to know about what type of rock it is and how old it is. Many of our most beautiful vistas exist because of neat geologic processes. And it's up to us to put the pieces together and understand how the puzzle fits. There are three main types of rocks, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. Igneous rocks are made from volcanic processes. This is like volcanoes and intrusions, like the one that made Half Dome at Yosemite National Park. This is where rocks like obsidian, which makes arrowheads, and pumice come from. Metamorphic rocks are rocks that have been changed by pressure and heat. They're usually folded and compressed, and some of them have really fun names like schist and gneiss. Sedimentary rocks are made from erosion and deposition. This is rocks like sandstone or siltstone or mudstone, not such creative names as the metamorphic rocks. And this is often where we find preserved fossils that were buried under different depositional layers. The rock cycle is how geologists figured out how rocks change from one type of rock to the other. As mountains erode from rain and weather, the sediments travel downslope and eventually are deposited and buried and compacted to become sedimentary rocks. Once those rocks get buried deep enough, they're then under a lot of weight and pressure and they get heated deep in the crust to become a metamorphic rock. If those rocks get buried deep enough, they can melt completely and form magma and make different types of igneous rocks that make their way back to the surface from volcanic eruptions and intrusions. Plate tectonics is a scientific theory that helps to explain the rock cycle how some fossils came to be where they are today, and why we see volcanoes around the Ring of Fire. The Earth is made up of seven major tectonic plates and dozens of minor and micro plates that move over the underlying mantle. This diagram on the bottom shows how tectonic plates interact. When tectonic plates converge, the colder, denser oceanic plate gets pushed under the thicker, hotter continental plate in a subduction zone. Off the coast of Washington is one of the largest subduction zones in the world, the Cascadia Subduction Zone. It has ruptured in the past and created massive earthquakes and devastating tsunamis, and it is capable of doing so again. When the oceanic plates subduct under the continents, they get pushed deep into the earth and eventually melt and dewater, generating magma that rises as volcanoes on the continental crust. This is what makes the Ring of Fire and all the volcanoes that we know and love in Washington. Oceanic crust is created at mid-ocean ridges in the middle of the ocean from underwater volcanoes that spread the seafloor and keep driving the subduction cycle. I mentioned earlier that geologists have to understand how old rocks are to put together the pieces of the puzzle. This is important to figure out the history and how the rock got to be where it is today.
Scientists use fossils and organic matter to date some rocks, but they can also use some pretty neat tools to zap lasers at different minerals, like zircons, to understand how old the rock is. The oldest rock geologists have found on the surface of the planet is 3.8 billion years old, and it is found in Australia. That's older than your grandma, for sure. The Earth is 4.2 billion years old. The oldest rocks in Washington are only about 750 million years old, and those are found on the eastern and northern part of the state. The geology of Washington is the result of a complex history of tectonic events. It's a combination of various terrains that you see here on the screen, accreted or added through geologic time. The terrains of Washington we see today resulted from continental evolution, where pieces of ancient continents, hundreds of millions of years old, have broken off and reattached to form different continents. Washington grew from east to west, and the ocean shoreline migrated over millions of years from Spokane to where it is currently today. The rest of this presentation will go over some of the most significant changes Washington has undergone. I'm going to start in the north with the North Cascades Mountains. The geologic history of the North Cascade Range is a complicated puzzle that records over 400 million years of various rocks and terrains that have been scraped off the ocean floor, smashed together, folded and buried, faulted and moved, finally making their way to their present day position in western Washington. After the chaotic assembly of the various terrains, a chain of volcanoes grew and erupted, covering the already complex geology with lava and ash. Volcanism continues to this day. Mount Baker and Glacier Peak are two of the youngest volcanoes in the Northern Cascade Range, and they stand out above the rest, reaching over 10,000 feet. As the coastline moved west, as new rocks were smashed onto Washington, the landscape continued to change and evolve. About 55 million years ago, the coast of Washington was inland from where it is today, and older volcanoes that have long since been buried littered the landscape. During this time, large rivers flowed from east to west and deposited much of the coal-bearing deposits mined in Washington at that time. The Seattle and Bellingham area would have looked like a swamp, and different creatures roamed the planet. As the continent continued to grow and change, the Columbia River basalt group started erupting about 17 million years ago as a series of flood basalts that cover much of south central Washington, Idaho, and some of Oregon. Flood basalts are large volcanic eruptions, similar to the Hawaiian style, where a great deal of basalt is erupted and covers an extensive area, about half of Washington. The Columbia River basalts originated from a wide area near the border of Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. The basalt mostly came from fissures in the ground, perhaps sourced from a hot spot or a volcanic center that is now beneath the Yellowstone caldera. The lava flows buried older landscapes and petrified some trees that lived there. Over the last 37 million years, the Cascade Volcanic Arc has been erupting a chain of volcanoes that follows the modern Cascade Volcanic Arc that we see today. The five big stratovolcanoes we are familiar with are Mount Baker, Glacier Peak, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, and Mount Adams. These are the result of a renewed episode of volcanic eruptions, which began about 75,000 years ago and generated multiple eruptions throughout the Cascades to this day. Evidence of repeated eruptions from these volcanoes exists in the geologic record and as recently as 1980 and 2008 at Mount St. Helens. From Mount Baker to Mount St. Helens, each volcano has a dynamic history and is still active today and could erupt again tomorrow. This brings us to the most recent chapter of Washington's geologic history, the Quaternary, spanning from about 2.6 million years ago to the present. During this time, the Northern Hemisphere was plunged into a series of ice ages, and all the while volcanoes continued to erupt. Both processes deposited new soil that many of us live on. During this time, at least four major ice advances covered much of Washington, thousands of feet thick. Before glacial times, the climate was much like that of today, and evergreens and Douglas firs, spruce, and lodgepole, lodgepole pines scattered the land. Once the ice arrived, the advancing glacier drastically changed the environment. Sediment shed from the meltwater streams in front of the glacier buried and destroyed the forests. Geologists occasionally find wood and plant material within the sand and gravel deposits. 
of the glacier continues to advance further, low-lying areas were inundated with meltwater and fine-grained silts and clays, trapping organic material ripped up by the glacier. Glacial lakes were created as the glacier advanced and retreated. At glacial maximum, glacial lake deposits may be very thick as the glacial lakes would have persisted in the landscape for tens to as many as thousands of years, constantly accumulating silt and clay from front or sides of the glacier. As the climate warmed, the ice began to waste away rapidly, leaving behind a complex dynamic environment and occasionally leaving behind large blocks of ice. Sediment transported in meltwater streams from the glacier often buried these blocks of ice in place, and the ice would take its sweet time melting, up to thousands of years, beneath this insulating layer of sand and gravel. Once the ice blocks melted, they left behind depressions called kettles. As the climate warmed, trees and plants returned, and some of these depressions often turned into waterlogged peak bogs. As geologists find more organic material within deposits that were adjacent to glacial ice, they can map out where the ice lobe was, and more importantly, when it was there. Many of these types of samples have been dated using radiocarbon analyses. From these data, they have reconstructed the path in sequence of the ice arrival and retreat. From about 19,000 to 16,000 years ago, the glacial ice sheet was at its maximum. This means it reached as far south as Tenino and was about 3,000 feet thick near Seattle, enough ice to cover the Space Needle five times. During this period, such creatures as mammoths, saber-toothed cats, and ground sloths lived and died with changes in the climate. Scientists know about the climate of the past by studying ice cores and mapping glacial deposits. Glaciers leave marks on the landscape. Many of the small lakes people swim in were formed by glaciers. The rivers today follow paths of glacial outwash channels formed thousands of years ago, and the hills and depressions in the landscapes are likely formed by Ice Age glaciers eroding and depositing massive amounts of rocks and soil. During the last Ice Age, one lobe of the ice sheet formed an ice dam and blocked a major river, the Clark Fork in Montana. This created a huge glacial lake, Lake Missoula, that was 200 miles long and over 2,000 feet deep. Over the course of 2,000 years, the ice dam failed repeatedly, rapidly emptying the contents of the lake. The floods that came from the dam breach swept across Washington and into Oregon, all the way out to the ocean. The floodwaters left scars on the landscape and formed some of the beautiful river channels, scablands, and giant ripple marks as hints to future geologists about the dynamic history of the flooding that occurred here in the past. We are lucky enough to live in a state that has a landscape carved by geology. The beautiful volcanoes that dot our skyline are the result of subduction. The glaciers that cover them remind us of the giant ice sheets that existed here thousands of years ago and carved the Puget Sound. Floodwaters covered our state as the ice sheet retreated and formed waterfalls and river canyons. The rugged mountains teach us about the building of our state many millions of years ago and the recent volcanic eruptions and volcanic mud flows remind us that we live in a dynamic world that is active and ever-changing. Many of the newest discoveries in geology are because of new technology and advancing science. One of the tools we use most is a system called LIDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging, where an airborne scanning rangefinder shoots lasers at the ground and helps us see through trees and vegetation to get a better understanding of the ground surface. We are now able to see traces of faults that have caused major earthquakes in the past, massive landslides, and river channel migration. To learn more about Washington geology and to download data, please visit these websites on the screen. If you go to the Washington Geology Portal, you can type in your address and see what the geology and geologic hazards are where you live and go to school. Feel free to email me with any questions you have. Rock on!